This is Michael Easley in Context. It's my delight to have Richard E. Simmons III on the program today. Richard is a best-selling author of The True Measure of a Man, Reliable Truth, The Power of a Humble Life, and more. His approach is structured on a methodical and a passionate way of transforming lives through gaining wisdom, applying truth to every area of life. In the late 2000s, he founded the Center for Executive Leadership, a nonprofit faith based ministry in Birmingham Roll Tide Alabama <laughs> Are you a Roll Tide fan? Uh believe it or not I am even though I didn't attend uh, the University of Alabama I uh I, I grew up uh, my dad raised me an Alabama fan and I I still pull for it. You didn't have a choice, right? No choice. <laughs> Roll Tide. Well, um Roll Tide. We're calling Richard this is a, we're calling this series uh Biblical Manhood in a Man-Hating Culture. And that's a little bit of a clickbait title, but it, it seems to me as, as uh, you know, being around the block, we're about the same age. Uh, for the Christian gentleman, life has changed dramatically in the last two, three decades. And you're probably familiar with the Danvers statement that was crafted. And we've been going back to that. We've talked in our series about egalitarian versus complementarian. Egalitarian meaning equal value, equal role complementarian being equal value distinct role and of course i'm going to line up with the equal value distinct role when we're made in god's image and you've written a book that it was exciting i can't even remember someone in my church said have you talked to richard simmons because he heard about the series we were doing i said i don't even know richard simmons <laughs> so I'm, I'm thrilled to have seen you do some decent homework on the good homework on this i, I notice you uh you uh wrote an inscription uh, tribute to your dad in the book, to Dad, my hero. Um, not a lot of guys can say that, Richard. Yeah, I, w- I was very blessed uh, to uh, have a father that really modeled uh, not only true manhood, but I think uh, being a Christian man. And uh, one of the things that I noticed about him through the years was um, he, uh, he was very humble uh, he was, uh, uh, I always, I tell my children this today, uh, you know, he, he was president of everything that he did. He was president of his company. He was president of, of uh, our local quarterback club. He was president of the, the country club he was a member of. And yet, in all the years that I knew him, uh, he's been gone about 11 years, I never heard him curse, ever. Never use any curse words. He, he just had real uh, quality speech. And it had a huge impact on me as a kid growing up. And I think it's impacted my life. It's impacted my two boys' lives. And uh, I, I'm truly, truly grateful for him. I, I, I miss him still. Uh, I think about him all the time. And, yeah, he was my hero, no doubt. So tell us a little bit about why you chose to write The True Measure of a Man, kind of a culmination of what you were doing. Uh, in one sense, yes. Uh, Really, the, the uh, origin of the book uh, came from a series of uh, presentations that I made. We, we have these big events. Uh, it's, they're kind of an outreach for men, and we bring in speakers, and I'm often one of the speakers, and then we'll bring other speakers in from the outside. We're trying to get Bubba Watson to come speak uh, maybe in the fall, for instance. But um, this goes back to 2009 and, and uh, maybe 2010, you know, when we had the, the real economic uh, collapse and um, uh, I gave a, probably four or five uh, presentations, talks to a large group of men. And Michael, I don't think I've ever had anything that resonates with men like this did. Uh, it was at a time where, you know, the unemployment was high. Uh, we'd had a number of men in our community commit suicide. And uh, the, the timing was right for these talks that I gave. But then um, I just had a number of, of, and I'd written a couple of books uh, prior to this, uh, but it was, it was recommended that I have the talks transcribed and maybe you know, add some additional material and, and write it. And uh, really, that's what I did, and never dreaming that the book would do as well as it's done. And we still, uh, Michael, we, we still sell a lot of these books. And I'm asked to come and speak on the book. Um, and which I'm, I'm glad to do, but uh, it's been a real blessing. You know, our approach is we, our desire is that uh, uh, the, the work that we do would be a blessing uh, to men. 
and would glorify God. And I think that hopefully the book has done both. Um, just for our listeners, uh, and we'll have information on how to get the book in the show notes as always, but you could just put True Measure of a Man and Richard Simmons in your search engine. And voila, you'll find the book available from anywhere you can purchase a text. But I'm not going to read all the chapter titles, but I want to talk to you. you you've written chapters on a man's identity. And right. that one is, you know, that, that word's loaded today because we <laughs> choose our identity. Uh, we don't look at X and Y anymore. We choose our identity. Um, give us uh, Richard Simmons' primer on how you look at man's identity. Well, I think it's important to recognize, first and foremost, uh, how we form our identity. And um, I make reference to uh, uh, Dr. Charles Cooley, who I don't believe was a Christian, and he wrote um, uh, a a good bit about this. Um, And he said that the way we see ourselves as people, not only as men, but women, the way we see ourselves is the way the most important person in our lives sees us and um and it's called his his work is called the looking glass self and so as you can imagine when you're young you're the most important person in your life is your your parents and of course that's why parents i think need to encourage and love their children and train them uh well because a child will begin to see themselves as their parents do but as you know as you get older uh your parents are displaced by uh, usually your peers uh, when you get to a certain age, whether it's your early teenage years or, or whenever. And so all of a sudden uh, that you see yourself the way the most important people in your life see you. And if that's your peers, you're always seeking to please them, to impress them, because you see yourself the way you see the, the way they see you. And then, of course, over time, uh, that changes from the standpoint of uh, your, 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 your teenage peers to the people that you work with, the people that are in your community, the people that may be in your church. And so we're always really kind of identifying ourselves with how do other people see me? Of course, the main, one of the main points I, I try to make in helping men deal with and find a healthy identity is to ask the question, what if Jesus is the most important person in your life? And therefore, he is the one that forms your identity. How would that impact you? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm of the belief it would radically change you when you get to the point where Christ is the one that you're seeking to please, that you're seeking to live for, the one that you've surrendered yourself to. We have so much in the culture, Richard, that pushes, you know, how I feel and my persona and, of course, the LGBTQA plus uh, um nomenclature just talking about this in our culture makes people question well maybe i'm this way maybe i'm that way maybe my identity is not just being a man Uh, before even talking about being a christian just as a male of the species you've encountered this i'm sure Uh, how how do you address it with guys well fortunately i say i don't know what's fortunately or not most of them, almost all of the men that I deal with, uh, and again, I've, I've been doing this for, I was in the business world for 25 years, and I've been in, now in men's ministry for 21 years, and so I deal with, with predominantly businessmen, uh, a lot of executives, uh, attorneys, uh, and the people in the medical field and the real estate business. And, you know, most of them, they get their identity from how well they perform out in the workplace. And... Uh, um, it, you know, and for so many of them, uh, it, it, that creates all kind of problems, uh, because if, if the way you see yourself is determined by, based on how we you perform, what happens when you don't perform well? What happens when you go through a, a tough economic cycle, uh, where your business would, you know, you have no control over it when the economy goes bad, but your business goes down the tube and, and we sure have seen a lot of that. And so for most men that I deal with, Michael, their identity is wrapped up with their performance out in the workplace, and it creates all kind of problems. And I, I do write about it fairly extensively in the book, True Measure of a Man. So, our, and, and we do this all the time. You, you, you're with a group of guys, whether it's a social function, a neighborhood cookout, a church gathering. First, you know, we, we trade names, and we say, Richard, what do you do? <laughs> right? 
right? My identity is I'm a doctor, I'm a realtor, I'm a developer, I'm a pastor, I'm a, you know, whatever. And and I, I work very hard in our world of, of in context trying to help people understand the Western mindset is so hardwired to have a biblical mindset takes some, you know, pretty concerted effort to think that I'm made in the image of God. I'm ma- made as a male of the species. I have a purpose here that's beyond being a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher. Um, I, I'm prattling a bit, but I, I guess I'm looking for your, you know, your take on that. How do we help these guys yeah. move from my identity is what I do. And I, and frankly, we spend the best part of our day doing that thing. Right. Well, wh- the way, way I like to put it, uh, Michael is for most men life is all about what I do and how successful I am at what I do and over time instead of being able to focus on doing your work doing your work with excellence we start looking around and we start wondering uh, well what what does he do and we always find ourselves asking the question what do you think about me and what I do? And what would you think of me if I'm average at what I do? But even the greatest fear, it's amazing, that men have is, what if I fail at what I do? What would you think about me then? I had, I have one of the, the seriously, the, one of the most successful, when I say, and when I say successful, he's done really well in his work. A commercial real real estate uh, 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 gentleman here in town, and I met with him for a period of time, and he shocked me when he told me he says every day that my feet hit the floor, I'm driven by one thing, and I was really interested to hear what he was going to say. He said I'm driven by the fear of failing. Now, if you looked at this guy's house and you looked at his cars and you looked at his lake house, you would be shocked to hear that and, and he's such a confident person and yet deep down he struggles with the fear of failure and so this is just one of the many indications of just the incredible struggles that men have and we discover it through our work here we have a big counseling practice here um, I meet with a number of individuals uh, but it's really shocking uh, Michael what goes on in the in the in the in the heart and the mind and the in the uh, I guess you could say the mental health of businessmen, and uh, I mean I, I could speak at length about this, but uh, the one thing that really strikes me, uh, one of our counselors here said, you know the the the, uh, the depression rate for men has risen dramatically, and he said that I don't think we realize that the 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 rate of depression among men is significantly greater. Than is, than is measured by the social sciences. Because Richard, he said, so many men struggle with depression and yet they don't will not come out of the closet and admit it because they fear it won't make them look very manly. And to go to counseling is just not a manly thing to do. Buck up, get to work, don't complain, keep your nose down. That's it, you got it, you got it. Be a man, don't cry. Um, when you look back on the, and I like to think about decades, the twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, um, what you and I were dealing with in our twenties, thirties, forties was very different than what men are dealing with today. What have been some of your insights and observations and maybe even counsel to those different decades? Well, it's kind of interesting, uh, my, my first thought on that, even though I do think this has been, is a, has been a problem, even going back to biblical times, but um, I, I was reading where, you know, for, you go back into the 60s and the 70s, maybe in the 80s, we, we were kind of what was, con- what w- was described by economists, we were a producer-driven gr- economy. We were into production and producing things and, produce- and providing services. And now we are described more as a consumer-driven culture uh, where we are, we are out spending money and buying things. And one of the problems with that is what drives us uh, in what we purchase today is how does it make me look? It's this idea of conspicuous consumption, uh, which is so much more of a, of a problem today than it was 30 or 40 years ago, even though I think that's always been an issue. But it's, it's a much greater problem 
today. And I think also with what, what people call the graphic revolution has, has made a huge difference in life. Uh, starting with you know f uh, photographs that were in news maybe in newspapers, and then you, you you went from the radio to the television, and so you could be seen on TV, you could be in the news, and then of course with uh, the social media we have today, uh, it has just had a huge impact. I'm sure on women as well, but it's had a huge impact on men, the way they see themselves, the desire to be famous, the desire to be well known. Uh, they do everything. We seek to do everything to impress because. We have this great fear of what do people think about me? What do people think about me? Do, do you find, because um, I remember when Cindy and I got married 23 and 22, um, you know, I, I say we, we were Dave Ramsey before Dave Ramsey was around <laughs> because we were the product of the builder and the depression and you, you didn't spend money yeah. you didn't have. You lived under your income. You never went into debt. You paid cash. And if you did, you lived in terror to, you know, pay the debt back um, and now you meant you you nailed it consumerism is an ideology that is hardwired uh, the, the iPhone is an example every iteration we've got to get in on at least that one or the next one and really it doesn't do that much more or better than one that was five years old so so things have changed in that regard uh, Dave Ramsey says I think he says that you know we we buy things with the money we don't have to impress people we don't like or something like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that. That's great. That line I'm missing, but point yeah. point taken. And, you know, you and I are trying – the one part about being in your 60s, looking back, is you try to encourage guys, don't work so hard in these areas. There are more important things, <laughs> you know. And yet the culture is like a, it's like a river. And right. then you add in this identity crisis, and, and my point is more to the gender debates – is that uh, you can't be masculine, you can't have courage, you can't be a leader, you can't be strong, you've got to be feminized. Uh, you know, it's it trigger words. I don't feel safe around a white man, yeah. and I don't know how it affects you know the area of influence in Birmingham, but this is huge around the country, and uh, and you see guys withdraw. You, you've said about you know if I don't perform, I'm nothing. They don't want to engage these battles, Richard. They don't want to step up and smile and say, you know, I appreciate that we have differences here, but I'm glad I'm a man. I'm glad to have courage. I'm glad to step in front and stop someone from hurting someone else. Uh, yeah. it's, it's just a different context. It really is. And as you're saying that, I, I, I've, I'll share this with you of kind of a side note, because this happened today. Um, I, I felt like, you know, here in the Bible Belt in the South and, you know, Birmingham, Alabama is a very conservative state. Uh, that, that I would not be impacted by the, 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 the woke culture and the cancel culture. It's something that I read a lot about, but it doesn't impact me. And yet, uh, I was recently asked, and I won't mention the college, I was, I was asked to give the commencement address at a college here in the South. And um, I, uh, the, the, the president of the college invited me to do this, and I had a, I had a really good message prepared to, to share and then I get a call from him that a couple of their professors in the college, uh, they've gone to our website. They 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 basically have looked at and investigated uh, the work that I've done. And ten years ago, I I taught a three-part series on gay marriage and homosexuality, or homosexuality and gay marriage. And um, uh, they found this, and they. They brought it in front of their peers, and they the, the faculty voted uh, to uninvite me. And the president tried to really f <laughs> to stand behind me and try to figure out how to get this done. But even the board of trustees said, you know, I'm afraid the faculty is going to disrupt commencement, and we don't want that. And so I got uninvited today. Wow. Wow. Yeah, And, and again, I, I don't have any, uh, you know, overtures of going out and starting a riot or standing on a Bible, a shoebox with a Bible, beating people over the head. But I find men live in, you've already articulated some of the issues they, they are fearful of, failure, for example, performance, money, success, whatever their career ladder is. Uh, nobody wants to be mediocre. And, right. and then you add in this trepidation of you can't use the wrong pronoun. You've got to be kind. You can't say, you know, I, I was... Uh, 
called in with a leadership team years ago because people didn't feel safe when I did evaluations. I hurt their feelings. I'll get out of here. And I reeled back and said, well, how do I tell somebody they're not performing and it not hurt their feelings? <laughs> we hire them to do a job. They don't do it. They're not around. I think that's my stewardship to say, hey, I need you to work on these three goals and report back to your manager and to me that you're getting something done here. If you've got a problem, let's Absolutely. resource you. I don't feel safe around Michael. Well, it's a different world. And, and the outcome of that is, you know, we become pablum. We, we become passive. And then, you know, the old axiom that the wrong thing fills the void. No, I agree, and as you're sharing that, it, it makes me wonder where all this is leading. Uh, I, I do think there are going to be consequences. Uh, I think there will be t definitely a reaping. Um, you know, God makes it clear, whatever a man sows, this he shall also reap. So there'll be some type of reaping in our country. Um, of course, my desire would be to see some type of revival, but, you know, it, it may get a lot worse before we see anything positive happen. When you have a, a marriage that, you know, when you're talking to men, you're also talking to marriages because yeah. invariably if, if they talk to you, Richard, they're going to come around and say, you know, my wife and I, or we have this trouble and, and it always falls in money, sex, and power. Those are my categories. There's issues about money, issues about sex, issues about power, who's making decisions, who's in control. Uh, give us some uh, Richard Simmons anecdotes or rules to live by <laughs> when you're dealing with guys, because these problems aren't new. The culture is right. different, but the problems aren't new. Right. Well, there's 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 several things. Uh, one particular, uh, and I feel very strongly about it, and I've seen this uh, operate in my own marriage, uh, is the fact that there, there are going to be times in your marriage where you don't feel like you, you, you don't have the, the, the great feelings for your wife or your marriage is not in a good, in, in a really good place. Um, and that's when we're called to really love our wives uh, with our actions. We may not have many feelings there, but I always find, and I think that marriage counselors will tell you, your feelings will follow your actions. If you will love your spouse, uh, even when you don't feel about, feel like it, and you serve them, uh, over time it will have a transforming impact on your marriage. Particularly as a man, if you'll love your wife, she will have, she will respond eventually. I, I promise you, she will. Now, one of the things, and I talk about it in the book True Measure, um, and I'm, I'm, I feel very strongly about this. Um, it, it's in the section where I talk about where how how fearful we are. And we're always wondering what people think about us. And when we were early in our marriage, when our, we had three children, my wife informed me that we need to go to counseling. And my response to that was, we don't need to go to counseling. And the reason I felt that way is, here I am, a Bible study teacher, you know, a, a Christian leader in our community, and I'm having to go to counseling. And I'll just tell you this, the best thing that we ever did was go to counseling. The problem is the counselor that we went to was in an office building, a very public office building, and I remember running into people and said, what, what are you doing here? And I mean, how, I thought how embarrassing it is to tell you that I'm, you know, my, my marriage needs counseling. But, but truly, I, I, I do encourage uh, men to go to counseling, um, that there's, there, I think there's a real place for that. Um, I think it's very biblical, you know, talking about the need for, for, for to having good counselors uh, from the Book of Proverbs. Uh, so I'm, I'm I'm real big on on that, um, and I, I'm I'm sure there's several things else that I if I really got into it I could share with you. Um, I, 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 I in my own personal life, in my own personal marriage, and God has really blessed me with a wonderful woman. Um, I, I think being very intentional about spending time with her, being connected to her. Uh, it's made a huge difference, and she really appreciates that. Uh, so I've been very blessed. I really have. We were uh, 10 years married, and I, I went to Cindy, and uh, I was pastoring a church, and I looked around the church, and wonderful people. They love God. They're trying their best. But I looked around the church, and Richard, I couldn't find a couple that I wanted to aspire to be like. <laughs> and it was like this wake up call and I had I've been super blessed with mentors but not in that local church at the time and it was a rude awakening to say 
entropy is tough to beat easily. And if you're going to be different, you're going to have to do different things. And so unlike uh, you, uh, I was the one that drug Cindy to counseling, and she did not want to go. <laughs> it was like, well, tell me what you want me to do. You go yourself. And I know we, we're one, and we got to work through some things. And, and again, it was, uh, without, without overstating it, it changed the whole trajectory of our married life. Now, that said, I have to caution people, you got to find good counselors. Because right. in our town, there's a counselor on every corner, and uh, you must be careful that you find you know someone that's grounded in the right principles. Because um, yeah, that's a different that's a different uh, can of worms. Um, talk. I, I do have one. I, I do have one. Let me just share this because I think this would be as significant as anything I could say about marriage. Uh, and this comes from a, a close f- couple friends. They've been married for 40 years now. He was in he was in residency. Uh, they were married, they had two young children, and they were up in Minnesota. And uh, they reached a point where they realized, we hate each other. We don't love each other anymore. Um, we, we should get divorced. And they met, went and met with someone, and they're both Christians. And they realized that they did not have any grounds for divorce. And so they just made the decision, well, we'll we're going to stay married, and we're, still, we're going to work at it. And, 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 and here they are 40 years to, uh, later, and, Michael, they have one of the best marriages I've ever seen. So that, that's just, that has always resonated with me, how easy it is just to throw the towel in when, as believers, um, you, know, we, uh, you know, we have very few grounds for, for getting a divorce. And so uh, I, I think we always need to keep that in mind. What, what, and, again, Birmingham and Tennessee, Nashville, Tennessee are very different microcosms, but um, are, are the men that you minister with, because you, you, you made this comment earlier, you're not, you're somewhat, um, you, you don't deal with some of the larger national LGBTQA pressures right. that we're seeing right. in, in certain cities. The music industry, the art industry in Nashville is very, uh, leans in toward, you know, who you are as a creative and an artist and what your sexual, you know, preference and identity are. We respect that and we love you and we tolerate that language is is very um, it's tectonic. It moves along, and people find themselves checking what they say. And this is what I see with men: is that they're afraid. They're afraid to to take that stand at the school board or whatever, and say, you know, uh, I beg to differ. I respect you, but I beg to differ. To be a man means to take leadership, to involve in risk, uh, to take you know to make decisions that might affect you poorly. I mean, to, to the nature of a man, I, I don't like the four pillars because I think they've been over overworked, but there is a time to be a warrior. There is a time to be a lover. There is a time to be a sage or a person that comes along and fights. Uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, well, the one one thought that I've had, and I've, 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 I've spoken on this recently, is that I, I find so many uh men and, and women, even believers who, you know, want to emphasize the fact that we are not to be judge, we're not to be judgmental. You know, the scripture talks about, you know, in, in the book of James, there's only one lawgiver and judge, and who am I to judge my neighbor? And they say that as if the fact that, you know, we should not stand up and, and speak out against uh, uh, homosexuality or gay marriage or whatever. And, uh, but I think, what Christians forget is that we're also called uh, to make moral distinctions and we are to say certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And if we fail to do that, we're going to, we'll, we will, we'll lose the culture war and uh, you know, we, we'll lose our country in effect. When, when you, um, you may have an optimistic view of the culture, uh, a pessimistic <laughs> view. I don't know. Um, what, hope do we have Richard obviously revival obviously you know God's working in hearts but when you look at the landscape where do where do guys find hope oh wow that's a really good question um you know the the thing that I I I think that I really seek to do with the men that we meet with that we mentor that we disciple in fact it's really at the heart of the book, The True Measure of a Man, is what what is true masculinity? What does it really mean to be a man? In fact, the uh, the publisher, 
uh, who, when they were interviewing me to try to determine whether they were going to publish the book, this is 10 years ago, he asked me, what is the true measure of a man? And my response was to become Christ-like. And that's not something that a lot of men really are interested in because of their view of Christ. And what I, I try to share, and this is what we teach, and this is really the goal, is that men would become more like Jesus. And I've tried to explain and in, in our teaching is what is Christ like really like? What does that really mean? Because I think most people have a, have a dim view of Jesus. I'm talking about men. Uh, they see him as someone that was real religious. He didn't have much fun. Uh, he, he's just not very appealing to me as, as, a, as a, say, as a businessman. And so what I've shared is, and what I have seen when you read the, the particularly you read the Gospels, uh, that first of all, Jesus was not religious. Um, he had a lot of, he had, he had joy in his life. The problem is you, when you read about someone, you can't see the joy, but you, he talks about wanting to put his joy in us. Um, but the fact of the matter is, I think that Christ likeness involves three things. Uh, it involves your character, it involves the wisdom you possess, and it involves the, your ability to love others and to have deep substantive relationships. And the character piece is, is the, the, the I, I guess, as we've been talking about, uh, having a willingness to, to stand up for uh, what is right, what is moral, what is true, what is good. Um, that's a big part of it. And Jesus, flat out, was not afraid uh, to uh, upset the apple cart. Uh, it, it's interesting when we, and again, the country's wide and a lot of opinions across country in, in Christian pockets, but I, I'm just struck with the um, the emasculation in general. Yes. Uh, we saw Leon Podel's book years ago, who's a Catholic, The Feminization of the Church, and it, it, Gordon Dalby's Recovering the Manhood, and then, of course, we had Robert Bly's Iron John and Smoke on the Mountain, which was the secular side, and that was sort of overtaken by the the uh, gay movement. And then we come along, you know, Stu Weber and others popularized some of these ideas, the four pillars of a man's heart. And I know some of the things you reference in your book are, are very kind of time stamped. As you look back on these things, and I kind of look back at Robert Bly as sort of the one who started this in, the, in West Western literature, where we are today. What do you see trending next? And it's a complicated question, but we, we, these things yeah. don't happen. We're always reacting to something, right, Richard? We're always overcompensating. What's the next trend that we're going to face that men need to be prepared? Wow, Michael, that is a really good question. Um, uh, because as I deal with, and, and we have probably, you know, five, 600 men that we, we work with here at the Center for Executive Leadership. And I, I think uh, some of the trends that we're seeing is the, the continuous problem with materialism. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, I think you're going to see more and more men struggle with depression as they, uh, they truly don't understand what real manhood is. Uh, they are always comparing themselves with other people. That, that's one of the big things that I see over and over is how men are always comparing themselves with each other. And it, 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 it wreaks a lot of havoc in their lives. Um, but, you know, I'm really not that good at probably uh, uh, <laughs> predicting the future or being able to discern where we're headed. Um, I, you know, I'm, in, I'm kind of in the fight every day with these guys. And... Uh, uh, I, I see that there's just there's there really is a lot of fear out there uh, when you look at at, at where I, you know the, the state of our, our world right now the state of the United States and I think there's there's a lot of fear out there and fear can paralyze you and I think that you're going to see a lot of paralysis uh, in men when we should be moving and acting instead of just sitting back and being passive. When when you and I'm not so much thinking about the, you know, predicting the future, but we do, and you articulated the depression and fear and whatnot. Uh, I'm always thinking about outcomes because when yeah. you, in our 60s, there's a joy of 
you know, I, I don't have to impress anybody anymore. I'm not trying to make a name. I'm not trying to earn wealth. You know, I've kind of been there, done that. I got to the top of the mountain, and I found there was another one I couldn't get to, you know. And, and so <laughs> you learn that by, you know, I, wisdom can't be, there's no shortcut. And then there's this solidarity you have. You, you mentioned the goal being more Christ-like, and that, that sort of, you know, that, that was my final question, if you will. will. But I would, I would tandem that to say, give guys purpose, Richard. What's their purpose? And it, yes, I want to be Christ-like in my marriage, in my parenting, in my grandparenting, in my dealings with relationships. I read a book years ago called The Longevity Project. Don't know if you're familiar with it or not. Hmm, I'm not. But I'm it's not. an extraordinary set of clinicals over I want to say three decades or more of 1,100 people that they followed and extraordinary data. But the bottom line was you're pretty hardwired, whether you have heart disease or diabetes or whatever, there's really not that much you can do about it. If you're obese, if you drink too much, if you're a chain smoker, that might hurt a little. But at the end of the day, there's no real hard data that says living this way is going to make you live longer. Yeah. It's extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. So as we get older, and I tell people the runway is short. <laughs> when you get in your 60s, 70s, it's a short runway. So for me, the clarity becomes, okay, I want to be Christ-like. I want to be more. I often ask our church, are you any more like Christ than last year? Right. Are you any more like Christ than the day you were saved? Howard Hendricks said, if you were ready for heaven the day you were saved, why are you still here? <laughs> right? But now, I like that. yeah, but now it gets ginned down and I have to say, what's my purpose? Because mm-hmm. my purpose isn't proving something to other guys in business or in medicine or law. My purpose isn't maybe making more money. Maybe, you know, being, being independent is a wonderful thing and having your house paid off. Those are wonderful, godly contentment things. But that's not an end. Once those things are checked, Am I going to play golf? Am I going to go to Sarasota and blow up my aorta? I mean, what am I going to do? So <laughs> I find, you know, what's these guys' purpose? Yeah. Well, I, I think that's, uh, first of all, you're spot on. And I think uh, so many men uh, don't live with a real sense of purpose. In fact, I was reading where only 5% of the population has a real sense of mission for their lives. The other 95% just react to life as it comes. Uh, but this is one of the things that I really challenge the guys that I, I, I work with. And most of them, because of my age, are men in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and even 80s. Um, and what they don't realize, and this is where I think the real challenge comes in, is to let them know that <clears throat> the most effective years of your life where you can really make a difference are ages 55 to 80 or even higher, depending on your health. And so that these years in front of you can be the best years of your life where you can make a difference in the culture. Uh, but, but so many men, even Christian men, think when I get to this age, you know, I want to uh, go into leisure world and just enjoy myself. And that, that would be tragic for our country, but it would be tragic for Christendom as well. Um, I, I'll give you an example. I had a guy, he's 57 years old. He, he works for, uh, at the time he worked for Merrill Lynch. Uh, he went out and raised a million dollars to build this house for this ministry that uh, ministers to, to young girls that uh, have been uh, trafficked. It's a wonderful ministry. And he, re- he went out and raised the money, and they had, you know, they had the money to build this house. They have a series of houses. And I asked him this question. I said, do you think you could have raised a million dollars when you were 30? And he laughed and he said, I don't know, I could have raised $10,000. But now at the age I am, he's got, think about when you, when you get to be 55, you, you're, you're wiser. You should be a lot wiser, but if nothing more, for, because of the mistakes you've made. Um, you have more time because you've raised your children. Um, you have more resources. Uh, your sphere of influence has grown. Uh, this is the time to make hay. This is the time to make a difference. And if we could get all men to do that, uh, no telling what we could see happen in our country. Um, talk a minute to pastors. And I think if you had a room of 100 pastors in, down there in Birmingham, and uh, they've got their own issues as pastors, but they've also got a room full of men who 
don't look at a pastor the way they used to. Um, yep. Used to be he was a person of wisdom and experience, and now he's sort of a, you know, he's a tick on a dog. He didn't work for a living. <laughs> he didn't know business. Uh, you know, he's touchy-feely. He reads books. We don't read books. I mean, it's a very different culture than, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And how do you encourage these pastors and how they should communicate, minister to, walk alongside the men in their sphere? Well, it's 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 uh, ironic that you asked that question because last week I spoke to a group of pastors uh, and, and leaders of, of, of in a certain denomination, a conservative uh, evangelical denomination, and I don't know there was a hundred, hundred and fifty men there, um, and I, I I chose to speak on, and this is what they, some of the leaders encouraged me to speak on, um, was the importance of of humility. Because I think one of the great principles of life, uh, and it's really a paradox, is that strength is found in humility. And uh, most men don't get that. Uh, I think pastors have the same issues and struggles that businessmen do. Uh, they measure their lives on their performance. You know, how, many, how large is their church? How large is their budget? And uh, how, how well do they preach? And... I have found that, Michael, the, the, the greatest impact that on my own personal life is just learning uh, the power and, and the blessing that comes as we learn how to really humble ourselves and live a life of humility. Richard Simmons, the true measure of a man. You can find the information in the podcast notes on how to purchase it or just put Richard Simmons the third in your search engine and it will populate the true measure of man pick up the book it's an easy read it's very common sense uh, uh, very digestible grab grab two or three guy friends and say let's read this book together and talk about it once a week you might even encourage one another and change some lives Richard thanks for your ministry thanks for your time and thanks for jumping on in context Michael, I really enjoyed it. Uh, you're, you're, you're delightful. You really are. This was great. God bless. Thanks.